Well, 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 thank you for another show of politics, of politics. You decide with Tula Cabal and brother, brother Justin Barnett. Yes, yes. And you know what I always say? If you hear the sound of my voice, that means God has blessed you to see another day. Prayers go up. Blessings come down. Well, let me tell you, we've been blessed to have one of the 13th congressional, uh, congressional, congressional person running for Congress. Her name is Sakira Lynn Hawkins. She showed up in the station today, and I'm going to tell you, uh, I, I, first of all, I'm blessed that she's here, yes. you know, because I'm, I'm going to be honest, you know, as we do on this show, I'm going to tell it like it is. Some people didn't show up. So just for her showing up, giving some type of respect on, on, to Highland Park, because this is one of the areas that's within the 13th Congressional District, we appreciate that. And as we say, you know, we'll put some respect on her name. Her let's right? go. So, Kyra Lynn Hawkins, please, let's give a round of applause. Let's her. go. All right. So, Miss 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 uh, Miss Hawkins, is it okay if I call you that? That's fine. Uh, so, Miss Hawkins, can you please share with uh, our audience, uh, share some information about yourself with our audience? Okay, sure. Thank you for having me on the show today. Yes, um, ma'am. My name is Shakira Lynn Hawkins. I was born and raised in the city of Detroit. My mom was a Detroit police officer and then later became a nurse. And my dad was a tool and die maker at Chrysler mm -hmm. and a proud UAW member. I attended the University of Michigan for undergrad and U of D Mercy for law school. And I have been an attorney for over 20 years. For the bulk of my career, I was a public defender. I've also mm -hmm. worked um, in corporate law at Chrysler Financial. For a period of time, I was executive director at a domestic violence shelter, mm -hmm. and uh, for the, I also was at legal aid in the civil division. Mm. But again, for the bulk, I was a public defender for the last two and a half years. I worked for the city of Detroit first as an administrative hearing officer, and then as a senior assistant corporation counsel in the law department. And now I am back in private practice and running for Congress and hoping to get some support. Uh, out there in Highland Park. Well, and, and I'm going to tell y'all, you know, my, my mom always told me, listen to what people say, but watch what they do, because what they do is who we really are. She's here. She's yeah, here. She, she, so she showed up. She showed up. And she showed so up. so just for that itself, hey, put some respect on her name and, and pay attention to her. So please tell me, what led you to want to run for public office, particularly in the 13th Congressional District? Okay, well, I was born and raised in this district. Um, again, I was born and raised in Detroit. I have roots in this community. I raised my son in this community, and I care about what goes on. I care about the people. Um, you know, as a single mom of a young black son, I look and see what, how the world treats us, you know, and I would be remiss in my duties as a parent if I didn't do everything I can to make the world a better, safer place for him. You know, as black people, we, I say we are, you know, living behind enemy lines in our own country, you know, and have targets on our back. And I want our government to work for all of us. You know, we pay taxes. We deserve the same rights and privileges as anyone else in this country. We've been here over 400 years. And we have to stop expecting someone to come to our rescue. We have to stop expecting, you know, them, the powers that be, to treat us fairly. We have to stand up and fight for our rights, you know. The, the struggle for civil rights is not over. You know, we are, we are still behind in education, health care, housing. You know, we have to at some point take the responsibility on ourselves and be that change that we want to see. And I just didn't see it. I didn't see it in the current congressman. I didn't see it in anyone else running. So I said, you know what, I will step up and I will be that voice that my community needs. I ran for judge in 2020 on a platform of expanding the mental health and drug treatment courts, stopping the school to prison pipeline, and ensuring justice for everyone in our community. Because as a defense attorney, there was only so much that I could do. As a judge, I felt I'd have a greater reach and could help more people. I wasn't successful, but it got me experience running for office, and it made me realize that what I really want to change is policy. And that is what led me to run for Congress this year when, again, I didn't see that voice, that leader that I needed to see that talked to me about the issues that matter to me. So. I decided to run. You know what? Okay. I, I mean, you know what? That, that is a powerful statement 
And, and the reason I'm saying that, because I talked with some voters yesterday, and what they said was, Ms. Akira, Ms. Hawkins, I'm sorry. They said, was fine. Sakira, what they said was they felt that the Democratic Party have forgot about the small person, the people that you represent as a public defender, mm -hmm. right? So would you say, well, do you think that the Democratic Party, because I had a Democratic Party use the concept, they always come out and say, well, we're fighting for the middle class. Well, what about the so-called marginalized or poor black, particularly, let me narrow this, this down, poor black people. Do you feel that, from your opinion, that the Democratic Party are representing the interests of poor blacks as well as middle class? Or are they just focusing more so on the middle class? I don't even know that they're focusing on the middle class. I think that, unfortunately, our political system has been corrupted by the ultra-wealthy, which are the billionaires, and large corporations. You know, I saw a list out today of all of the corporations and the vast amount, we're talking millions of dollars, um, that they contribute to political campaigns, largely Republican campaigns. And, you know, we, need, we definitely need campaign finance reform. Um, but to answer your question, I've been voting since I was 18. You know, I couldn't wait to vote. And I've always voted for Democrats. It wasn't until I decided to run that I, you know, joined the Democratic Party. And I told myself I either want to run for Congress to represent my district or I want to have a high-level position within the Democratic Party. And, you know, down the road, that may be something that I, I look into because I feel that, you know, come election time, they come to our community, they pander to us, you know, throw a few picnics, have a few giveaways, and then that's it. No, they're not doing enough. And I want to change that. I want to make our government work for everyone. I want to protect Social Security. I want to make sure that everyone has access to the medicines that they need. I want Medicare for all. You know, I think that we have, to, you know, how is society treats its most vulnerable? You know, be it those with disabilities or our senior citizens, that's how we should be judged. And we cannot neglect our responsibility to the generations that came before us. So if I'm in Congress, I will work to protect senior citizens. I have a mom, you know, who's in her early 70s, and I want. I, you know, if, if the government doesn't help, then that burden falls upon me. And I won't say it's a burden. I mean, you know, I do it joyfully and happily. You know, my mom made lots of sacrifices for me. But what about people that don't have children? What about people that don't have, you know, children that, you know, have degrees and can afford to help them and take care of them? You know, we have to look out for everyone. And I would do that if I'm elected. And no, I, I, I don't think that the Democratic Party does enough to help those in marginalized communities. But I will look into, uh, you know, I will enact issues, enact legislation to make sure everyone has access to clean air and water. Okay. I think that clean air and water is a human right. I believe that, um, you know, we have environmental justice issues. You know, no one should be, you know, walking outside and not be able to breathe in clean air. But when we have corporations that come in and they set up, usually in black and brown communities, you know, um, environmental air quality becomes an issue. And mm -hmm. no one seems to care about that. Sure. I want to change that. You know, I'm not here just to, you know, I know a lot of people will say, oh, we've heard it all before. But here's the thing, you haven't heard it from me. And one of the problems right. of electing people based on name recognition is that nothing changes, nothing has to change. You know, we hear the same old platform, the same old, you know, sayings, because you're electing the same old people and they're just shuffling around positions. You know, coming to you as a candidate, whether it's me or anybody else, we're asking you for a job. We're asking you to hire us. Thank you. And if we're not doing a good job, don't give that person another chance. Mm. You know, across the board, people have, you know, every demo most Democratic leaders have said that our current congressman has not done anything for our communities. And because he has money, to show some commercials, people think, oh, yeah, he's telling you what he wants you to hear. That doesn't mean it's the truth, okay? We know that some po people in politics lie. You know, look at the former president, okay? Don't be fooled by those commercials and his ability to pay for them, okay? You know, look at what he's done, and he has not done much, so don't give him another chance. You know, two years is two years. That's a long time to mess up and not do the job that you were hired to do. Let someone new come in. You know, I have the passion, I have the drive, I have the intelligence. I'm ready for this job and this position, and I want to actually help people in our community. 
Well, you said something. That, well, I mean, well, I'm, first of all, powerful, powerful. I'm going to say it this way. You touched on several issues, but I would just like to say. Uh, so it, uh, a lot of people don't understand, first of all, how lobbyists work, right, lobbyists. So, so, uh, you know, tell me if I'm wrong. When a, lot, when a person is trying to run for office, you said something about money. It's interesting. The lobbyists come in and pay them, hey, we'll donate a million dollars to your campaign, but if you get in office, this is what we expect. Try to and move I, in a different direction. And, and I, so exactly. I, I call it uh, political pimping in a different way. That's and I call, I'm just made saying it that way. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's a true statement that a lot of our politicians tend to use the people to get in office, but once they get in office, you get the lobbyists coming up, pandering them, giving them money, and thus the lobbyist is the only one to have direct connection to them, meaning direct phone. Hey, uh, this is Mr. Johnson, as opposed to. Miss Jones down there who gave $5 to the campaign and you was kissing the babies at the church, now you want to accept a call. Do you think politicians favor lobbyists over everyday people? Well, it would be lobbyists come into play after someone is elected. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and the election process is PACs, political action committees. They can pour vast amounts of money into a candidate's campaign or in the uh, instance of our current congressman, he's wealthy on his own, so he can, you know, pay for his own, uh, you know, commercials. Although he also did use a fair amount, a large, I won't even say fair amount, a large amount of taxpayer dollars for advertising um, before the, the cutoff, which was in early June, where he can no longer use taxpayer funds for his billboards and his commercials and his mailings, all of which cost tens of thousands of dollars, I just want you to know. Um, but yeah, you know, it, it grants you access, and that's what the problem is. That's why, you know, I started off by saying that our political system has been corrupted by billionaires and large corporations because, you know, they basically promise these people we'll keep, we, we will keep, you know, blood, money is the lifeblood of politics, unfortunately. Right. Um, and I always say, you know, when people say, well, you know, he has a lot of money, and I'm talking about the incumbent, you know, he has a lot of money, what can you do? I mean, I can't do anything about that, okay? You know, unless I hit the lottery, I'm not going to be able to compete dollar for dollar. But I would hope that, you know, the voters, the people that actually cast their votes will listen to me, will uh, appreciate what I'm saying, and will understand and believe that my heart is for the community. It's not for my own self-promotion. You know, I'm out, I'm, you know, I'm an attorney. I would be okay. I could, you know, do another job and, you know, never enter politics and everything would be fine. But I can't do that because of what I see going on in the world. The injustice, you know, how we pay taxes and we don't get what we deserve in this, our communities. That led me to run, you know. So, yeah, it's hard. You know, but if the people will get out there and vote for me and support me, then it doesn't matter how much money he pours into his campaign or some organization pours into his campaign because the people are the ones who vote. The people have the power. We just have to use it. Well, you know what? And I'm going to say unbossed, unbought. Shirley exactly. Chisholm. Eh? Exactly. You, you know what I'm saying? So you remind me of Shirley Chisholm when she started out. Let me tell you, she was, um, you know how you have your photo on Facebook yes, and then you have yes, the, the backdrop. It was Shirley Chisholm. So yep. I'm glad you said that. Uh, Thank I'm you very much. I consider that a compliment. Yeah, absolutely. You. Because you know what? People, listen, and, and Malcolm X said it well. He said, people will elect you if you speak the truth to them. Mm -hmm. So it's not about money. It's about the passion people have. Mm -hmm. So now you, <laughs> and I, and I got to ask this question. Um, First of all, I want to go back to the senior citizen. You said something that's true. So let me share this just quick story and, on, and piggyback off what you said. My mom was in a nurse home, two, April, I mean, January 2020. She was on there for rehab. My mom was sexually assaulted while she was in a nurse home. Right? This really happened. Um, February, we find out. We went in, met with them. I recorded a meeting. So in April, uh, 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 March of 2020, my mom ended up catching COVID-19 from a staff member. She died April 8, 2020. I'm sorry. But in the process, thank you so much, there was no investigation done. And I seen a lot of senior citizens at that nursing home who needed some type of assistance when investigating the abuse of the nursing home. So Very good point. My question to you, should we be narrowing down, focusing more on hiring organizations Separate, separate organizations or independent organizations that would go in and do a thorough investigation on nursing home because what they was doing, the ombudsman would announce to the nursing home when they're coming. So when they come, they, have, they try to have my mama sign a statement. I say, uh-uh, uh-uh, uh-uh. 
I tell the lady, you're not a specialist in senior centers of sexual abuse. What are you doing? So uh, again, let me ask the question. Do you feel that we need to s really narrow down on abuse in nurse Because we all know it's there, but what's being done about it outside the lobbyists that lobbies people or politicians not to pass legislation or laws that will protect, I mean, stop, stop me, that will cause the nurse home to be investigated. That's what I want to ask you. Will you narrow down on that and make it more of a focus of, a, of senior citizens truly benefits, not only in nurse homes, but in adult foster care as well? Mm -hmm. Good point, Tula. About that. I will say this. Let me give you a quick story. Um, my neighbor is a veteran. And I went over, it was back when I ran for judge, uh, to get his signature on my nominating petition because you need a minimum of 4,000, maximum of 8,000 to get on the ballot to run for judge uh, in Wayne County on the, at the circuit court level. And he told me he only votes for president. That was the craziest thing that I ever heard because, of course, you know, our president matters. You know, I mean, we are right now, uh, you know, our, our democracy is in danger and there are you know two competing right. campaigns where one will take us backwards one will move us forward it is important that everyone gets out to vote for president but before that like even now in this primary you know we're electing state reps state senators county commissioners those people at the local level control more of our day-to-day -day existence than the president than members of congress you know, so that is where, you know, it really matters who you vote for. It, you know, be involved in the process. I know that the older generation understands, but a lot of these young people today just don't, apparently they aren't being taught, you know, civics and government, which is something that I hope to, you know, do change on my own. You know, I'm talking to some people and we're going to try to do like a politics and civics 101 so that, you know, uh, to gear up for this next election so that we right. could get more people involved in the process sure. because it is very important that people are involved because their vote is their voice, you know, and that is a question that, you know, you should be posing to the people that are running for state rep and uh, attorney general because that's who actually is supposed to be investigating those issues, you know, at a congressional level. I can put funding in it, you know, make sure that, you know, That's everything, it. you know, all these uh, facilities are adequately staffed, you know, but how that money is directed and in investigations, that's something that, that, is hap that happens on a local level. Now, as a congresswoman, you know, I'm going to be honest. I don't know everything about everything, you know. <laughs> I, I, I'm a lawyer. Uh, I've majored in sociology. I know about the law. I know about, you know, people and governments and systems. But, you know, um, I went to a, a, a disability forum. And, you know, um, uh, apparently they're being told they need to call in and they need phones and some of the people that have disabilities don't have the technology that they need. You know, it is only by going to these events and hearing about the struggles or about what's going on. My mom stays with me. She's not in a nursing home. So, you know, I wouldn't, and I understand that nursing home abuse happens, but it's not something that, you know, I didn't know was that widespread of an issue. Sure. You know? So mm -hmm. it is one of those things where if I'm elected, I want to stay involved because those closest to the problem are closest to the solutions. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you know what, I will have roundtables. I'll have town halls. I want people to know that I'm accessible. If you are having an issue, if it's not something that I can solve, I'm going to put you in. We're going to find out together who would solve that problem. And we're going to make sure it's not about passing the buck. It's just like, you know what, let's figure out who needs to hear about this issue and let's all get together and collaborate and find a result. I you like know? that. So I want to stay involved. I want to be a part of the solution and I want to facilitate problem solving. That's my word right there. She said the magic word. She Solute said solution. That's it was uh, one, of, one of the points that I was always talking about is what is the solution. So I'm, I'm glad that you had brought that up. So let me. It's important. So I want to, okay, I want to ask um, you, man, this is deep. Um, the, the, uh, the, the investigation process, as you said, you know, when uh, you get like organizations that, that come in, you, you give them the funding. Mm -hmm. So the assumption is because there's no follow up that the organization is investigating adult foster care abuse or nursing home abuse. One thing that the nursing homes did, and I'm, I'm going to say this to you because I talked to them directly, 
Hey, I went to a room, and like I said, my mom was on there for rehab. I said, where's the phones at? One of the workers told me we don't give them phones because we don't want them calling to report the abuse of what they saying occurred. And or you call up there, they say, hey, oh, you know, they're okay. You know, they, we bought my mama a phone. They would take the phone from it when charged. This is the things they did. So my question is this. Should politicians, those who represent their district, should they request that cameras are put in there so we can watch the care of our family member in nursing homes? Now, uh, Pete Lucido from uh, Macomb County Prosecutor, when he was a state senator, suggested that. And the nursing homes got mad and started hollering the HIPAA law. I, I, I disagree with that. So I'm asking you as a person that, that would go to Congress, mm -hmm. will you suggest that in a bill that cameras should be placed in nursing home in an environment where the person who has guardianship can watch the treatment of their family member if they so choose? When my granny my father's mother was in a nursing home we visited frequently you know just to make sure that what you're talking about didn't go on and i understand and appreciate that hey everybody can't maybe make it there two or three times a week to check on their loved ones and to make sure that you know they're being treated well i also recall people having i don't it was a while ago i'll be honest um, but I, it was like in college is back when, um, you know, we, when she was alive and I want to say that she did not have a private room. So mm. I do think that people are entitled to dignity and, you know, to not have every move monitored, you know, um, because it's like, well, there may be one person who, you know, um, let's say their family member, you know, is busy. They can't make it there frequently or they live out of state or they live out of town or something. Um, and they would want that, that uh, you know, that constant monitoring. They may be in the bedroom next to somebody who, you know, maybe can get up and move about on their own and they want that privacy. Oh, yeah. So I think that it's a balancing act, okay. but certainly for people that are that are, you know, um, in such a situation where they are unable to care for themselves, maybe they could be in a room and that there should be that choice where people can opt in okay, okay. for video uh, okay. taping or okay. opt out of it. Okay. And then that protects the rights of those who don't want it, but at the same time provides a layer of protection and security for those who do want it and so that their loved ones can keep abreast of what's going on. And you guys are speaking like a 24-hour camera that's going to be in there? You know, I mean, again, I think that is, you know, we... Because this is a good that, idea. I mean, right. I'm you just... Know, well, I mean, I would imagine, you know, that, you know, abuse can happen at any time of day, you know, anywhere. Hospitals, you you know, are monitor, you know, certain rooms. So I think it should be something like okay. that. And if it requires 24-hour monitoring, again, if that is something that that family wants for their loved one, then they should be able to select that option. Yeah, because I have an uncle right now that's in a nursing home, and they're next, right next to each other in that room, so... You know, and also just be careful who you select and where you, um, you know, put your loved one and make sure that, you know, the family, you know, the, the, the administration is open and say, hey, listen, if I want, I want to hear from the nurse, you know, I want to check up every six hours or at least every shift. You know, I want to be able to call and talk to someone or at least say, hey, I want to be able to call and talk to my loved one if they don't have a telephone and they should be able to do that. And if they're not willing to do that, then that may be a red flag and that may not be somewhere where you want to put your loved one. And I think that's a good point, because what they were doing, you know, in some cases, they'll make you think that your loved one is, oh, they're OK. And I go up there, I'm like, why you didn't call me? My mom be like, oh, they didn't give me. Enough. So so I, 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 I agree with that. So let me ask this question. Um. It's interesting. You says uh, in civics, civics, mm -hmm. a lot, and, and you tell me if you think I'm correct on this, a lot of marginalized, as they say marginalized, poor people fail to understand the importance of civic and voting. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that, one, that the congressional district that you're in should have a civic lesson or a program where everybody can go learn about civics in marginalized or poor areas, and two, should they be putting civic classes back in the grade level one 
all the way up until 12 so people can learn about their civic duty in urban areas because it's taught in suburban areas. Let me ask that question. I think it's a failure of our school system that government and civics isn't taught. Um, I certainly learned about it, you know, in my school. I remember high school, freshman year, I ran for student council. You know, that, that maybe led to my running for Congress now, you know, that experience, being a part of it, realizing that, hey, if we want something changed, we need to, you know, uh, we have a system where our needs can be addressed and we can work on achieving these things. You know, our majority rule, if this is something we all want to work towards, then hey, let's put, you know, some people up at the top and let them work towards achieving that goal for us. I loved it, you know, and, and, and it's shocking to me that it's not taught in the schools. But I believe that that is by design. If you keep people ignorant and you don't let them know that they can change things, because trust and believe your vote matters, because if it didn't, they would not be trying so hard to deprive you of your right to vote. The Hello. fact that they don't want you to vote is because they know that it can change things. It can change things for you. It can change things for your family. It can change things for future generations. Okay? But if they don't tell you you have that power, if they make you believe, oh, voting doesn't matter, oh, my vote doesn't count, oh, nothing is going to matter, nothing is going to change, and then they don't have you vote, then they can come in and do whatever they want with the money that you're paying. Okay? So, yeah, they're trying to keep people ignorant and let them think that voting doesn't change anything or voting doesn't matter. And sure, take it out of the school so then you have an entire generation brought up believing voting doesn't matter, voting doesn't change anything. And I told you, that is why hopefully I will be elected. But, you know, I'm starting from the ground up for the next time because I promise you I'm going to run again. I'm going to make them spend a whole bunch of money every single year that uh, there's an election. I'm going to do a podcast or, you know, reach out on social media, and we're going to start with Politics 101, Civics 101. Okay. Teach people about our history. Teach people about how, you know, our ancestors died Fair. for the right to give us the right to vote. So, you know, they didn't have it. We do, and we take it for granted. The fact that, you know, the primary turnout is about 18%. General election, they say about 34 percent. That is appalling. I mean, seriously, it's like we need to vote. We, when you don't vote, you're saying you don't care what happens. Do whatever you want because I didn't care enough to get up and put a piece of mail in the mailbox or the voting slot, you know, to actually change things for myself, my child, my family members, my offspring to come. You know, that's, that's basically what it says. When you don't vote, you have to vote. And I understand. We've all been disappointed. But you know what? Shake it off and look for somebody else to vote for the next time. Let's give my part of applause. Thank you. I told you. What, what I say, unbought, unbought. Shirley Chisholm. So I want to so ask this question. Um, because well, I want to give a scenario, because what you're saying is true. And, and what marginalized people, poor people primarily deal with is, is and I'm just be real, food stamps and Medicaid, mm -hmm. right? So in order for us to get this Medicaid and food stamps, it was passed under Linda Bain Johnson in the 60s, mm -hmm. correct? But they had to do what? They had to pass a law, mm -hmm. right? So, and the reason I'm saying this, because poor people have to recognize, if you, if you agree, that in order for us to... And, and, and I think sometimes the Democrats pimp us with that. So I'm just putting that out there. They beat that to death. They don't try to encourage us to be independent. But for those of us who need that, if we don't vote, guess what happens? You vote somebody else in there, they snatch it from under your feet. Mm -hmm. Then all of, a sudden poor, all of a sudden poor people run around talking about what happened. So when I tell them, hey, you have to vote. Mm -hmm. Now, can you add on to that particular statement? They can identify with Big Mama not to have no check. And no food stamps, because Big Mama, who took care of us, or having our mama when we fall in our luck, or us ourselves using it as a way to come up out of our condition so we can do better, even single moms, mm -hmm. those who can. Yeah. So can you explain from that perspective? Yeah, let me tell you this. Um, I attended a health care forum, and, um, you know, they talked about the possibility of better care for all, but they also talked about the Affordable Care Act and Medicaid, and they are under attack. If the Republicans have their way, Medicare, Medicaid, the Affordable Care Act will all go the way of the dinosaur. It will be extinct. It will not happen. You have to get out there and vote to protect the fundamental health care rights of, of, 
of, of citizens, you know, especially those who cannot afford health care. You know, the Republicans are, you know, all they care about is big business. They don't care about the individual. And, you know, as a dem Democrat, you know, the Democratic policies are basically, we're all in this together. You know, whether I have the ability to pay or not, or, you know, I may have insurance, but I still care about what happens to the person down the street who may not. Exactly. You know, I may be able to send my kids to private school, but that doesn't mean that the kids who can't afford private school shouldn't get an education. Right. You know, it's like let's collectively put our money towards the things that we all need at some point. You know, I, I mean, everybody may not have a kid, but everybody's going to get old at some point. You know, right. it's just like we, you know, we all may drive these roads. Maybe you don't have a car, but you take public transportation. Maybe, even if you ride your bike, you still want smooth roads. You know, it's just like there are certain things that collectively we can make better. Health care is one of those things, and it is going to be under attack if the Republicans have their way. So we have to elect Democrats, and we have to elect Democrats who want to make health care a priority. And I, okay. and, and I think that's a good thing because we have to understand that black people are statistically we have the highest effects well, the highest as far as the, uh, blood pressure and, and sugar diabetes. Exactly right? you know and, and, and yeah. exactly you know and to um, go back to what you were saying before how do I put this um, I'm sorry I lost my train of thought real f oh okay you were talking about you know how people are struggling and, and this came up really early on in a forum that I was at. Um, you know, they were talking about when it was a lot of community organizations, you know, community organizations that help people with housing, that help people with food, that, you know, um, whatever their insecurity may be, food insecurity, health insecurity, you know, um, they try to provide services to get people what they need. And, you know, they said that you can't necessarily talk about politics when somebody is hungry, when somebody is facing joblessness. And I understand that to a certain point, but the thing is, it's like politics kind of controls those issues, though. You know, your joblessness may be as a result of someone's political decision making. Your homelessness may be a result of someone's political decision making. So while I understand meeting people where they're at, there's still a responsibility there. You know, it doesn't take that much to vote. It, you know, it really, especially in Michigan, it is pretty easy. We literally, all, all we have to do is op go to our mailboxes. You know, we don't even need an excuse to vote absentee. You know, early voting. I've yet to stand, I mean, it's new, but the two times I've done it, I did not stand in a line. You know, I went in, showed my ID, got my ballot, and I was able to cast my vote. You know, the days of standing in line for two or three hours, I believe that's in the past. They've made it very easy for us to vote. So while I understand that, you know, people may not be caring about um, who is going to uh, represent them as the mayor or in city council or for Congress or for president because they are struggling to survive, you have to think about it because your predicament is 100% related to politics. It really is. There's just no way around it. It controls every aspect of our life. So when you are down and out, that's when you need to vote even more because you have the the greatest need for change, because you want to change your existence, you want to change things for your kids, you want to change things for your aging parents. If you want change, then you have to vote for it. And you start by not electing the same old people over and over and over and over again, because you know that is insanity and nothing will change. So give new people a chance. Well, let like me say that. I like that. Let's clap. Well, I got to get a clap to that one right well, there. I, I want to say this, and I want to see if you agree with the scenario, then I want to move. If you was if you had a company mm -hmm. and you hired somebody and they show they was not acting in the best interest of your company, would you continue to let that person work for you? Or would you terminate them and say, Hey, this ain't working. We gonna find somebody else because you ain't doing what you said you was gonna do. 
Can you elaborate on that? I would 100% fire that person, and I wouldn't let them now run for another job or apply for another job in my company. It's like, no, you didn't do the job that you had. I'm not about to give you more responsibility in another area. So, And that's how we have to look at politics. You know, we're hiring someone to work for us. When they don't deliver, it's time to let them go and hire somebody that will do the job. Okay. So I, we're going to have a conversation real now. This is kind of reparations. Uh oh. So, and, and I want to talk about this from a legal aspect. In 1860, I always bring this up, eight, April 16, 1862, Abraham Lincoln signed something called the Emancipation Act, where he gave slave owners $300 per slave if they freed the slaves and was friendly with the Union armies. He did that. 1988, President Ronald Reagan gave uh, reparations to Japanese Americans they had in determined camps. In, in 1942. 1989, John, John, uh, Congressman John Conyers introduced House, Board, House Bill 40. That was to evaluate the effects of reparations and the recommendations to be made to Congress as to what African Americans could receive. Will you pursue that same avenue that under uh, House Bill 40 that, uh, that Congressman John Conyers presented to Congress in addressing reparations for African Americans? And what is your opinion about reparations? This country owes a great debt to the descendants of slavery. We deserve reparations for the injustice done to our ancestors. So I 100% support reparations. You know, we, um, you know, we have uh, programs that help Native Americans. Um, we have programs that help uh, immigrants when they come into this country. You know, how are you not compensating the, the, the offspring, the progeny, if you will, of those who helped build this country and made it what it is today. You know, um, and it's, it's not just reparations. You know, how about a black hate crime bill? You know, I believe when it was, when they tried to pass one a long time, it wasn't a long time ago, but a while back, you know, they said, oh, we already have laws in place. Okay, well, I can't help but notice that you passed an Asian hate bill. Um, why didn't those same, didn't those same laws uh, protect against uh, hate against the Asians? Sure. You know, you did, that didn't stop you from passing that bill. It's just like every group seems to get recognition for past wrongs except for black Americans. Black people. You know, and no, something definitely has to be done about that. You know, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. You know, I, I would reintroduce that if I'm elected, you know, because that is something that will, you know, force, force uh, reform as it relates to, you know, the police and criminal justice. So, you know, I... Well, the 13th is a very big district, and there are different communities obviously represented. We have the richest of the rich, you know, on Lakeshore Drive and Gross Point. We have the poorest of the poor in areas of Detroit and, you know, Highland Park. Um, so I would, ha you know, I, would, I'm, I want to be a representative for everyone, but I am cognizant of what black, um, the debt owed to black Americans, and yes, I would 100% support reparations. What that will look like, I don't know. You know, um, I think, uh, you know, the issue has been brought up like, oh, well, you know, people just going to spend it on Nike and, you know, Gucci. Hey, if that's what they want to do with theirs, fine. Give me mine. <laughs> you know, I will figure out, right. you know, let me, use, I will, you know, let me use mine how I want to use it. If that's how they want to use theirs, yeah, I like fine. That. But, you know, and again, I, you, I, we can't even get, you know, student loans canceled. So are they going to, at least under the current makeup of Congress, suddenly, you know, pass a reparations bill that's just going to hand us all checks? No, but tax credits, you know, something. And yes, we are absolutely owed something. I don't know what it will look like, but I would support reparations. So let me, let me and I want to just comment, I'm, and I'm saying this as a co-host of Politics and Politics, so please don't blame Mr. Carey for this. Nobody ever objects to the Jewish Americans getting reparations. Nobody, nobody objects to anybody nobody, else so, it. So if, if, and what I've said, Mr. Kyra, and I, if you can comment on you once you will, if you want, why aren't you saying this, pushing the same, uh, why aren't you pushing that same agenda to African Americans if you see us 
as American citizens. Because you better not, and I tell people this all the time, you got people afraid to say, Germany should not still be paying uh, Jewish Americans or Jews. Uh, you wouldn't say that because you know the consequences for that. So why are, and I'm, I mean phrase it this way, do you feel politicians in general, black or white, that, that's cloaked under the Democratic blanket, are afraid to openly challenge or speak forcefully about African Americans getting reparations when they get in office? Or you, do, you, do you feel that they, they are afraid to support it and they're they afraid to push it because of the white backlash, and I say that with respect, for those whites who feel that we should not get reparations, do you feel they're afraid of that? Well, I mean, I think part of the problem is just that I don't even know if it's fear. I just think it's like they don't care and they don't have to. Again, let's get back to the issue of money. You know, there are far, far, far more black people in America than there are Jews. But here's the thing. The Jews have a very strong political arm called APAC. Right. APAC actually yep. yes, uh, yep. approached me and, um, you know, we were talking. Um, unfortunately for me, I would not say what they wanted to hear. And that's because, like you said, I cannot be bought or bossed. So I'm going to speak my mind and no one is going to buy my vote. No one can buy me. So I'm going to say what I believe and what I, you know, believe is right. And I'm not going to say otherwise just so that I can get some money. Now, would that money have helped my campaign? 100%. I would have been able to go dollar for dollar and beat mm. the current incumbent. However, again, I can't be bought. So I would rather, you know. Um, I like that. I, like that. A, I would rather take my argument to the people and ask them for their support than take money from an organization that, you know, has quite frankly bought a lot of politicians. You know, and here's the thing, you know, they, it's called, APAC stands for the Arab, no, I'm sorry, the American Israel Political Affairs Committee. And here's how it works. They require, I believe, um, their members, I think they pay about $1,800, something like that. They all, it's a whole bunch of them, and they pay a lot of money. And they probably pay more money than the, I think, I want to say it was $1,800. You know, correct me. I may be wrong about the amount. But basically, it's just like they pool their money, and they buy political power. And it works, people. It works. We see it in action. They, you know, have people up and down both sides of Congress because they're nonpartisan. You say what they want you to say, you're going to get their support and their backing. Okay? And so then when it comes up, hey, you know, we have this issue about Israel. Can, should we send, you know, millions of our tax dollars over there to bomb Gaza? Who are, who, who's making the decision? The people who have been put in office by APAC. So that is why they are very successful in getting what they want done. We, if we all contributed 10 bucks, we could do something, right. you know, right. but we don't mm. like to give, you know. Um, I, I, my campaign has, you know, had very few donations. And I was paying for it myself out of my own pocket because I know that I'm not going to be able to, you know, go to my black brothers and sisters and ask for money. Um, it's unfortunate. You know, but I understood that. So I'm like, listen, all you got to do is vote for me. I'm not begging you for your money. Just vote for me. So, and even that, you know, it's like, I don't know. You know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm faithful. I trust, you know, I believe that God, you know, put me here and put me in this position and that things are working in my favor and that I'm going to have a victory. You know, I, I pray for that. However, you know, you read any um, article, you know, even you said you didn't know I was running this race. And it's just like it takes money to get your name and your message out there. So all I can do is, you know, pray and hope that, you know, the word spreads and that people see my name and vote for me. Well, I'm going to say this. First of all, I'm going to say um, I, 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 I respectfully disagree with you on this level. I think people will support you. I think that you're in it, that you're, and I'm just saying this from a personal level. Not speaking for Justin. Who's no, I just meant financially. No, no, no. I, and listen, I'm, I'm saying they will support you. Okay. Shirley, they supported Shirley Chisholm. Okay. You got that same spirit and you got that same energy. People want, they, they'll give to you if you support their agenda. You see what I'm saying? So right. I don't think in terms of that. APAC, I'm familiar with them. They got Jamal Bowen out of, mm -hmm. out of New York. 
because he spoke against a ceasefire against Gaza. So I'm familiar with what APAC does. And I, I applaud you for not, not going there. So my, my question is this. When it comes to mental health, mm -hmm. do you feel, and, and I said it because I see brothers all the time on Six Mile Wood, mentally they're gone. Do you feel there is an intentional neglect in the black community when it comes to mental health treatment? And are we treated different? In many cases, when in the cops in the universal sense, I come to our houses and we have a mental meltdown, are we considered a threat thus? A Shannon, was it Santa Mosley? A Massey, the one that got killed? Sonia Massey. Sonia Massey, yeah. So do you feel that, one, there's attention to black for as mental health in the black community. And two, when we call the police for a mental meltdown, meltdown that we automatically are presumed to be a threat, thus the most deadliest force take place. Hey, good point of bringing that up. Before you uh, go into that, uh, one of my peoples, uh, John Walter Zook, got shot and killed by the police as well off of mental help. He had called the police and they came over there. On, I'm pretty sure you've seen that too. So I'm, I'm very interested in your answer for this one. Yeah, and so that I, just happened in June, right, Justin? This year, June of this year. Yeah. Okay. Um, again, uh, I think in this area, you know, we have a rather diverse police force, um, but I do think that um, there is a mental health crisis, not just in the black community, but in America. You know, we don't put enough funding into mental health care. We barely put funding into health care, let alone mental health care. And there needs to be a greater, um, greater attention needs to be paid to that. You know, when I ran for judge again, that was expanding the mental health court was part of my uh, platform because I saw it. You know, I know that a lot of my, um, you know, clients were suffering from some type of mental health issues and they needed help, not jail. You know, the jail should not be the greatest source of mental health treatment for members of our community. You know, let's treat them while they're on the outside so that they don't have to go in the inside. So, yeah, and I think that there's a bias anyway, and, you know, let's face it, you know, there are racist police officers, there are racist police departments, you know, I think that what happened with uh, Sonia Massey wasn't, wasn't just necessarily a mental health issue, I think it was a racism issue, which is why we need to pass the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act. You know, um, I think that there is greater attention being paid to that. I think it's 988 now. You can call instead of 911. Right. And that will address mental health issues. And I know that uh, in Detroit, they are looking for a mental health coordinator, someone that will assess situations before the police sent, are sent out. Because let's face it. You know, the police don't have, you know, social work degrees. They don't have psychology degrees. You know, sometimes they already come and they're already at a nine. You meet somebody with a mental health issue or, you know, a disability, they're just going to escalate it. They're not good at de-escalating. So until we put more money into training police to de-escalate situations, then, yes, we need to have people ready to take those calls and either go with the police or get there before the police to assess the situation and help the people so that people who are called for help do not end up dead because unfortunately that's what's happening you know the police come the person is out of their mind and instead of trying to de-escalate you know make the situation safe for everybody including the person the, the, that was called for you know the person that was the, the reason for the call you know to keep everyone safe including that person you know and the police aren't doing a good job at that and yeah and that's why we have these instances and when they're black and they already can say oh i fear for my life you know it's just a recipe for disaster and for tragedy so i think that you know we need greater emphasis on mental health training for those in law enforcement or programs like 988 that will assist and intervene and we also just need mental health training or assistance for members of our community all right so i got i'm gonna ask this question and it might be one of the last questions okay this is the elephant in the room 1955 the first black congressperson was elected in the 13th congressional district of detroit Think of 1968, 1967, you know, they had the Detroit riots. Think 1960 or 1969, 
uh, former Congressman John Conyers was elected to Congress. 2000, if I'm correct, 22 was the first time that the Detroit did not have a black elected official in the 13th congressional district to a, to uh, uh, in, in, a, in a predominantly black city. Do you feel? Well, no, because Brenda Lawrence was uh, oh, okay. elected before. So, so I apologize. Was it was it 2022 that? Uh, it was 22 that we got the current person. That, that's that what I meant. Yes, so I yes. meant to say it that way. <laughs> yes. Do you feel that a person? That's not African American because we know African Americans have had a unique experience when it comes to poverty. Our poverty is not like immigrants. We came on a slave ship. They came over here through the border. Most By the choice. Time. By choice. We came. We was human traffic over here. So let me say that we was lynched. We was why we denied all opportunities. Can they fully address the issues of racism when it comes to Black America and talking? Uh, about our issues and forcefully, forcefully, and I'm saying it that way intensely, address the issue like what you said, John Con I mean, the Floyd, uh, uh, John, uh, uh, the George Floyd policing builder. If you're black, you feel that pain. Mm -hmm. Can somebody that's non black, representing black people that's still marginalized and poor, speak for us in a way that we need to be spoken for if they have not had the same experience? I think that, I'm just gonna put it like this, our current representative, absolutely not. He does not understand, he doesn't know us. He moved into this district to run for office. You know, he didn't care about the people. He was, he, he lost for governor, he lived out there in Ann Arbor. He, those people weren't gonna elect him. You know, so hey, where can I go where, you know, the fact that I have some money will benefit me and I can get some, you know, throw a few picnics, throw some chips and hot dogs at people and then get elected. He comes to Detroit. You know, he runs for, I believe, state rep, gets elected, moves into the district just to run for that office, doesn't even finish his term, and then he's already running for the next office. And now he's like, oh, you know, I'm just like you. I was poor. Well, no, he came over here by choice. Immigrants have, you know, uh, they get benefits when they come here that the, the rest of us just don't get. Mm -hmm. You know, his experience, you know, being able to get uh, loans to start companies or, um, you know, grants, his experience is different from what it, our experience would be. You know, I don't care what, how poor you were. You know, I think it was Chris Rock that said, you know, um, there's not a white man today that would trade spaces with him and he's rich. You know, and, th and that's true. It's just like, that speaks volumes. You know, it's just like, we all know what the, ex well, at least as black people, we know what our experience is like. Now, could there be someone not black who has a strong black agenda and connection to the black community? Sure. Is that person in this race? No, it's just not. He is running for his own self-promotion not for the people. He does not know our experiences. He doesn't know us. And before you can presume to lead people, you have to know the people. You have to care about the people. And I don't see that with our current congressman. And, and I, I wouldn't vote for him, and that's why I decided to run. And let me add on to that. And I always say this to our people. And you see, well, uh, well, I don't know if you want to comment on this, but this is coming to look about. Can we go to a community that's not black. I already know where you live. No, so, no we so, cannot. We can, I don't know where the Indian population is, but the, we're not. No, right. we cannot go in there and then run for office and expect to win. We can't go to Livonia. Yeah, we have someone from Livonia who came to Detroit, moved to the district, and got elected. We have to, the white man's ice isn't colder. You know, um, somebody told me that story, and, uh, and it just makes so sense. So back in the day when they used to use ice cubes to, um, to, to keep their food cold, you know, they didn't have, you know, electric refrigerators like we do now. They used to buy big giant blocks of ice and the white company would not sell to the black neighborhoods. So there was a black ice man, okay? And mm -hmm. for years they got their ice from the black ice man. Wait, black ice? <laughs> well, oh, no. Yeah, I'm it thinking of air freshener. No, no. I swear. No, no, Let's no. go. Let's no. Go. They would buy their their, wa their frozen water mm -hmm. from the black man. Black, yes. The white people bought their frozen water, we call it ice, mm -hmm. from the white guy. And then times change, so now the, the white people start seeing dollar signs and saying, hey, you know, let's start selling to the dark communities. So mm. they start selling their ice to black people. And then the black ice man, 
the black man. Yeah, no, like, oh, nice, nice, man. Nice, man. Nice, nice, man. Yes. Go ahead. <laughs> he start, he's, he starts losing business. And they say, well, the white man's ice is colder. And mm. for some odd reason, we seem to have embraced that. I won't say we, because not all of us, but some people in our community just feels like, hey, they can do it better. You know, they, they're doing it for the right reasons. You know, they, they're, they're going to do a better job. And we have to drop that mentality. We, nobody is coming to save us, okay? They're not going to deal fairly with us. We have to put ourselves in those powers of position. As they say, if you don't have a seat at the table, you are on the menu, okay? Mm, we have to wow. stop waiting. Hey, hold on, say like that again. That. Say it again. Like that. If you don't have a seat at the table, you're on the menu. Oh, so, I, and, I, and I, we finna close. I just got to say this. I, I just got to say this. I want to say this. this <laughs> right. I mean, because you nice. just said, you done, you done gave me the Southern Chisholm chills. You know what I'm saying? Let me say that with respect. Um, you're correct. And we have to, I feel like a lot of us allow ourselves to be deduped or bamboozled in the, believing in something that's not real. It's like me selling you some land and, over down at Ghost Point, I said, "We well, give me the money, you got that, and the land ain't there. Mm -hmm. So my thing is, we should always vote our interests, and I want to say this to end, what you said. We cannot afraid to be black when it's time to be black. We Good don't point. tell the Ukrainians not to be Ukrainians. Mm -hmm. We don't tell the Jewish culture not to be Jewish. We mm -hmm. don't tell the immigrants not to be immigrants. But when black people do it, all of a sudden now, we be, no, we got to do for self. This is what we start in the South, because as you said, they didn't give us nothing. We had to, hunt. We had to get it. Mm -hmm. And I'm saying this to my Detroit brothers and sisters. Listen to what she's talking about, because what she's saying, this is the new up and coming Shirley Chisholm. Thank you. Unbossed, unbought. Remember, I told y'all this. She said on this show, Politics and Politics, she is the up and coming Shirley Chisholm. We appreciate you coming on here. Do you have any final words before we wrap up? Uh, I want to thank you again for having me on your show. It was wonderful meeting you all. And um, out there, if you have not voted, please fill in the circle next to Shakira Lynn Hawkins for Congress in the 13th Congressional District. I am running to make a real change. It is time that we elect a new kind of leadership, leadership that listens, leadership that cares, leadership that will deliver, leadership that will stay in contact, will find out what issues need to be addressed, and will come up with solutions to those problems together. So together we can make a difference. Please vote for me, Shakira Lynn Hawkins, for Congress. Thank you. Thank you. Give my hand. Thank you so much, Shakira, for coming Thank in. You. Thank, Thank you, you so much. And power to the people. Vote, vote, vote like your life depended on it. Amen. Thank you, family. Thank All right. you. All right.